Hey everybody, I'm Christy Jordan of southernplate.com and I'm here today with, uh, you can't see, but I have, both of my dogs are down here loving on me. They decide they want attention. Um, come here Zoe, can you come up? Zoe up, can y'all see? There's Zoe. My sweet babies are here with me today. Um, and anyway, I'm here to answer some questions today. I sent out a newsletter to my email subscribers yesterday and in that newsletter I included a special email address where I invited <coughs> excuse me, anyone who had a question they wanted to ask me about pretty much anything to uh, send me an email at that special address and ask it and I would try to answer as many as I could. I, I was really surprised at how many people had questions. I was thinking I was going to post the email address on Facebook this morning because I wasn't planning on having that much of a response, but I found that I need to go ahead and record a video soon <laughs> um, because I, I copy and copied and pasted all the questions into a document and there's six pages. So we'll just see how many we can get through today without this video going too long. And I appreciate you asking questions, and I hope that my answers are helpful to you. All right, so let's just dive right in. Um, this is from Lisa. She said, hi, Chrissy, I have two questions. First of all, I don't have a food processor. When a recipe refers to using one, will a blender work? I also, I have a seven-quart crock pot. I find many recipes suggest smaller ones. How do I adjust the recipe to have it work in mine? Thank you in advance, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, food processors are one of those things that, yes, I have one. I enjoy it. I love it. But I mainly use it when I'm doing, like, big batches of things. Sometimes I will go buy 10, 15 pounds of onions, and I'll chop them all up and put them in individual freezer bags and things. But if you don't cook on a bigger scale or if it's not, it's definitely, as often as I cook, it's not something I use very often. So I can see how it's it would definitely be an unnecessary expense in most kitchens. And a blender is going to work just fine for just about all the applications that you have. It'll work fine. You may have to sit there and pulse it and be a little patient with it, but it'll work just fine. Um, as far as the crock pot, um, crock pots and slow cookers are the same thing. I'm just telling you all that because I get asked that a lot. Um, sorry, I'm looking at oh, my hair is a little wonky. Anyway, crock pots and slow cookers are the same thing. Um, it's the same type of appliance. Um, a crock pot is patented by rival. Slow cooker is kind of a generic term, but if, you, if somebody has a crock pot, they actually have a rival brand. I tend to say slow cooker because all of mine are Hamilton Beach. And when I say all of mine, I do currently own seven, possibly eight. I love them. Um, and I, I've gotten them from Hamilton Beach, and they come out with new models, and I'll try them out. And when I'm doing a lot of recipe development, like for Come Home to Supper, for that book, I did a lot of slow cooker recipes. And there were days where my husband came home, and I had four or five slow cookers cooking on the counter. So most people don't need that many slow cookers. It has come in handy for me, though. Um, <clears throat> most of them, the, the family size ones, are going to be five, six. I, I don't have a seven quart. I, the six quart's the largest I have. That's like a good family size slow cooker. That would be the size that I recommend getting if you're going to go get one. And most recipes don't need to be altered at all. If you find that your recipe is overcooking or a little burnt on the edges or something, that's not really because of the amount you put in your slow cooker. It's because of the slow cooker itself is possibly cooking hot. If you haven't purchased a slow cooker, if your slow cooker is more than 10 years old, I do suggest you go buy a new one. The technology has changed. It's safer. They cook more evenly now. Um, your slow cooker, you know how we have the, the crocs that come out of them? Let me go show you something. Give me just a second. <laughs> what I call dog Mageddon. Okay, so this is one of my slow cookers. I keep this one on the counter because I just use it so often. Um, and you see how this, the crock comes out. The crock should come out of your slow cooker. If you have an older slow cooker that the crock does not come out of, you need to go get a new one. Those aren't safe to use. Um, they were at the time, you know, it was the best technology at the time. Now, a slow cooker, you know, when I'm telling you to go buy a new one, I'm not telling you to go invest two or $300, you know. It's not like one of those fancy stand mixers. You, 30 40 bucks, you can get a really nice slow cooker. They also have a warm button on them now, which is really nice. Um, but, no, I don't think you need to adjust anything. When you see a recipe 
most recipes are going to fill up at least half of your slow cooker. If you want to double it so you have leftovers, that's fine. But you're going to be just fine. Like I said, if you find you have a problem with the recipe itself, overcooking or something, look at your slow cooker rather than the recipe. So I hope that's helpful. I know I went off on a tangent there, but I, there was just some other stuff I want to make sure people knew. Okay, let's see. The next picture is from Allison. Um, she obviously read my, <laughs> my post about how I want to be a crazy daffodil lady. She said, do you have a picture of all your daffodils in bloom? I found your crazy daffodil lady story from 2012, and I'm crazy too. This is a picture of another crazy daffodil yard, and she sent me a lovely picture of her yard. I don't have any right now. Um, I don't have any good pictures of them in bloom because last year they didn't do very well. You know, a lot of it depends on what kind of winter we have. But if we have a good, um, a good bloom this spring, I will definitely get some pictures up because – I do love daffodils. They make me very happy. Um, I'm hoping I'll be able to see some soon. I can usually see daffodils for sale in the grocery store and stuff. The blooming ones in pots, they're usually for sale on my birthday. And I usually buy myself some for my birthday because I like to buy me presents sometimes. <laughs> Zoe, Zoe is scraping at the window because she sees a squirrel. Zoe, come. Stop. It's not nice. We can't get big squirrel hunt from the center all the time. Um, okay. Is heavy cream, and this is, there's no name attached to this one, is heavy cream really heavy whipping cream? And if so, why don't they call it that in recipes? I can't find heavy cream at any grocery store in my area. Okay, heavy cream and heavy whipping cream are pretty much the same thing. Um, there is a very minor difference, but not that you will notice in recipes. <clears throat> For our, our purposes, just use them interchangeably. I grab whichever one I pick up first, heavy cream, heavy whipping cream. It's a labeling thing. Um, one of them has like 30, one of them has, has they both have to have at least 30% fat, and that's what helps them to whip. Um, in order to be called, I think it's heavy whipping cream has to have 36% fat, but heavy cream can have 35%. I mean, something like that. So it's the difference is very, very minor. And at this point, there may not be a difference. You know, they've changed so much in how they label things. Sometimes things are labeled regionally, you know, where they are. It's like the whole big people telling you that sweet potatoes are yams in the grocery store. There's no yams in your grocery store unless you go to some really exotic special whole food store. I'll show you a picture sometime of an actual yam next to a sweet potato. Totally different creature. Um, but heavy cream and heavy whipping cream, technically there is a minor difference, um, but it's so minor that it shouldn't matter to you. Um, in a recipe. I really don't. It doesn't matter to me. Let's just say that way. It doesn't matter to me in a recipe. I grab whichever one I want, which by the way, if you've never put, if you ever have a little heavy cream in your fridge, pour a little in your coffee and mm, it's divine. Okay. Um, I hope that helped. Janie asks, how do you fix your mustard greens? You know, I fix all my greens the same way and I am a greens lover, but I fix them all the same way. If you look up my recipe for collards on southernplate.com, that's how I fix my mustard greens too. But now sometimes I started this lately and I know this may sound a little weird. Um, when my greens are coming in, in the spring, I will go out there and pick some leaves and I'll get me a, a, a baking sheet and I lay them out on it and I just spray them lightly with a little bit of cooking spray, very lightly. And then I sprinkle a little bit of kosher salt or sea salt on them and I put them under the broiler and I broil them till they're lightly browned and I flip them and I broil them again. And oh my goodness, they're amazing. You can also fry greens. They're really easy. It's really more of a saute. And I have a recipe for that on Southern Plate too. Just type in greens recipe, Southern Plate, and it should come up. Um, but they're wonderful and they're so good for you and they taste so good. I love greens. My family hates them and um, they even hate the smell of them. And one time I was cooking greens and my husband and kids came in and they're like, oh, what is that smell? You know, they're very dramatic about it. And my husband comes in the kitchen, looks in the pot, and he says, kids, your mom's cooking weeds again. So, yeah, that's their feelings on it. Um, this is from Teresa Anderson. Chrissy, I'm about to make a lemon meringue pie with lemons picked while on a trip to my son's home in Houston, Texas. A nice treat for old folks in central Alabama. The lemon, lemons are sitting next to um, some delicious navel oranges shipped to us from relatives in California. My question is, have you ever made an orange meringue pie? I think I may just try. I haven't made an orange meringue pie, but I have seen them before. 
Um, the trick is going to be getting the orange, making sure the juice is really concentrated, but then you're going to have to add thickeners and you don't want that to blend out your juice. That's why a lemon meringue pie works out so well because the lemon juice is so concentrated um, and powerful. But I actually have orange meringue pie on the list of recipes I want to develop for the cookbook I'm working on now. So you let me know if you make progress and I'll let you know if I make progress. <laughs> Maybe we'll end up with a recipe for us. And that's wonderful. You got to go see your son in Houston. Um, I'm so glad you get to go see your babies. No matter how old they are, you know, we, we have to spend time with our babies. So I'm glad you got to visit him. Houston's a fun place. So I used to go there a lot to do um, KHOU. It's a TV station there, I believe. Um, I had some friends in Houston, so I've developed some friends over the years, and uh, I really like that place. Um, so that's first sheet down. Okay, um, here we go. And this is from Joanna. Um, okay, I love your blog and have bought two of your books. Thank you. Also, we're going to use one of your books in our cookbook club at our library. Thank you so much. That is so sweet. I appreciate that. My question, what's the difference between salt? Sea salt, kosher salt, iodized salt, and any others? Thank you for the opportunity to ask you a question. Well, thank you for taking the time to ask me a question. I appreciate it. Um, okay, <clears throat> so sea salt is basically salt that's evaporated from the sea, like actually comes from the ocean water. It's delicious. And sometimes gun or something, you know, it's a cosmetic thing. It's really good salt. It's very nice. I love sea salt. Um, kosher salt. Well, let me start with table salt because that's going to turn into kosher salt, literally. Um, table salt is just the salt that you pour, like you get in the shakers and you have on your table at the restaurants and stuff like that. And that's what we use most of the time. Most table salt in the United States is iodized, which is actually a very good thing. Um, in the early 1900s, they started adding, adding iodine to salt. And the instances of goiter and hyperthyroidism um, greatly decreased in the United States. It was a real problem then. And it's not now. We don't, we've never heard of those things. Most people haven't because of iodized salt. It's really made a big difference. It also increases brain function. I mean, when they, once they added this to salt, they actually noticed IQ. There was a measurable difference in the IQ level of our country as a whole. It's that big of a thing. So not all food additives are evil, just so you know. <laughs> Some of them really help. Um, and uh, so table salt also has a chemical in it to help it keep it from caking. Um, but that's what we cook with most of the time. Kosher salt is actually, you know, we know a lot of things are, they have kosher. It means that they are developed using kosher practices and stuff. Kosher salt is different. Kosher salt is actually developed, it, sometimes it's called kosher ring salt. And it helps you to make things kosher. Um, it's table salt without the iodine. And they press it really flat together, compact it to make larger crystals so that you can then sprinkle over meat and things and it'll draw the blood out. Um, but I use kosher salt a lot in the kitchen. It is delicious in the kitchen because it has that larger flake to it. it you taste it better. Um, it just kind of really, salt is a flavor enhancer. And so bigger pieces of salt are going to enhance the flavor better, <laughs> you know, but you taste it better. You know how you bite into something, you have that little bit of a saltiness you can taste rather than being incorporated throughout the entire dish. It's just in little bites here and there. Um, and that's really, um, especially when I'm roasting vegetables and things like that, or as a finishing salt, if you put salt on top of something before serving it, Kosher salt's amazing for that. Sea salt is also good. You know, I use kosher salt and sea salt interchangeably. Um, so I hope that helped answer your question. Let's see where I am now. Um, now, okay, this is from Michelle. Okay, and I'm going to try to read this. Please know that I've lived in Alabama my entire life, okay? Aloha Christi. Haoli makaliki hu, which means Happy New Year in Hawaiian. Um, okay, and that's probably not the name of the language. I'm sorry, y'all. I don't mean any offense, okay? <laughs> I've never got to go to Hawaii. It's my mom's dream her entire life is to get to go to Hawaii. And so my dream is to someday be able to send her to Hawaii. So if I ever had an opportunity to go to Hawaii, I would probably just try to send mom instead because she wants to go so bad. Um, I'm staying for a long visit with my army son and his family in Oahu. Sunny skies, white, beautiful clouds, 73 degrees, and absolutely incredible blue waters. You know how cold it is in Alabama right now. 
<laughs> but I'm glad you're there. I'm glad you're having a good time. But if you're in the water and you hear the Jaws music run on the water, you can actually do that if you, you know. Okay. Um, I have a question about how to keep the bottom pie crust of an apple pie from being soggy. My son loves apple pie and pecan pie too. My apple pie flavors are great. Just the crust is limp. However, since I enjoy it with a generous scoop of ice cream, I was fine with it. What's the secret to a crisp bottom or crust? Okay, first of all, you have the right attitude. It's clear you have, you're a person with a generous, grace-filled attitude who has your head in the right place. I mean, I see so many things you're pointing out. Hey, here's a positive thing. Hey, here's, you know, this is, you're awesome. And so I just want you to know that thank you for having such a positive attitude about things. You are a joy to be around and I'm speaking for your family and all your friends and thank you. Now, you know, a lot of times when you have a pie crust, if you have something that's baked and you set something liquid on top of it after a period of time, the liquid is going to be absorbed. That's just all there is to it. But there are things you can do to help. And one of the main things is to blind bake your crust, which is basically you take your empty crust and you bake it for a little bit to get it kind of browned. And that'll help slow down that process. So I would recommend that. Also, if you're going to blind bake your, crust, bake your crust and you're mainly going for the bottom being done, go ahead and take a piece of, let me show you. Um, where's some paper? I'll take this. Okay, take a piece of aluminum foil. What I do is fold it in half. And then I end it like this. And then I peel this back. So just, you know, just the middle is uncovered and crimp this around the edges. So you're just, you're not cooking your, your edges because those are what burn easily. And you don't want to get those. They don't need extra cooking time. So I would do that. I hope that helps answer your question. I hope you have a wonderful vacation with your son. That's awesome that you get to go there. Maybe mama needs to go visit him. <laughs> okay. Um, this is from Tina. Hi, Christy. What is your one cooking and or baking ingredient ingredient that you cannot do without? If you have more than one, I would love to hear that as well. Okay. I thought about this, and before I started this, I meant to get something to show y'all. And I'm going to have to go. I wanted to go get it in just a second. Okay. I have three things I cannot do without, and neither of them are butter, which is surprisingly um, surprising. But, okay, self-rising flour. I love self-rising flour. You give me some self-rising flour, I can pretty much make anything. Um, eggs, eggs and self-rising flour, I can make anything and then some. And then the third baking ingredient would be milk. Um, I mean, I, I can literally, I can feed my family endless variations of all kinds of things if I just have eggs, flour, and milk. Now, the milk um, is a special, it's kind of an issue in my house because we don't really drink milk. Um, we're not real milk drinkers. The kids will eat it in their cereal from time to time, but it's mostly used in baking. And so when I buy milk, it goes bad. Um, so I have this great thing that I found and I'm going to have to, if y'all excuse me, I'm going to have to get up again and go get it and show you, but it's, it's right here in the kitchen. So I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. This is what I have. Uh, now, it's heavy. <laughs> this is a case of milk. Um, so what I do, instead of buying um, refrigerated milk, I buy this case. This is shelf-stable milk. And this is a quart, and it costs me a dollar. I keep two or three of these in the fridge at any, any given time, because if you're going to use it in cereal, or maybe if you want a little in your coffee or something like that, you want it to be cold. Um, and once it's opened, it has to be refrigerated. Once, but if it's not open, it keeps just fine on the shelf. So for baking and things, if you go to your fridge and you find that you're out of milk, no worries. You just go grab one of these. Um, and these sell a quart. And see, I'm, I hope I'm not ruining my source now. I hope I can still get this job. But um, these sell. I'm trying to put that down. At Walmart, a quart of shelf stable milk is close to three dollars. I've seen it more. This is Gosner's Dairy in Utah. It's all sourced from local farms there. They actually provide military, um, all kinds of good stuff in this milk. And I get it at Dollar Tree. And it's delicious milk. And it's 2%, but it tastes like whole, because I'm a whole milk person. Um, this is the most delicious 2% you've ever tasted. I have one nephew, whenever he comes, he, he always ends up opening my fridge and he always says, Wow, you got the good milk. He loves this. So I send him a couple things of milk every now and then because this is his favorite. So, But what I do, you can go buy it off the shelf at Dollar Tree, but I go online to their website 
and I order it cases at a time and that because it's shelf stable you know so you can buy it in advance and that way I get it in that box like I showed you and it's just easier to store and I can stack my boxes and stuff and they ship it free to the store so that's my big secret I love it um, so that's what I can't do without now let's see where else I am I'm about 20 minutes into this so I'll go for 10 more minutes and see what else I can answer I can't see y'all staying with me longer than 30 minutes, but bless you. Okay, um, Christy, I've loved, I have loved following you and trying some of your recipes. Your cream cheese peppermints are wonderful. I tried to eat all of them and not share. Thank you. Now's the time that my husband and I need to start a healthier diet. Have you ever thought about recreating some of your scrumptious recipes as either low carb, low fat, etc.? I'm not the most creative cook around and would love some different recipes. Sincerely, Yvonne. Well, I do have some recipes on Southern Plate. Um, and I included it in my big archive post. If you go type in, um, I think it's called Southern Plate January Archives or something, um, you'll see just about every January, except for this one, I posted a big list of better for you Southern recipe collection, 16 sugar free and sh low sugar or no sugar recipes and all kinds of that stuff. So I have a lot of little treats that are better for you on there. Um, and then it's easy when it comes to recipes. If you're making a casserole or something, if something calls for cream soup, use fat-free cream soup. Um, I mean, you know, the meals aren't usually our problem so much. Um, it's the desserts usually and the breads. So probably ease up on the breads. I hate to say that. It hurts my heart. Um, <laughs> but uh, just check out some of those uh, Better for Your Diet Southern Recipe Collection. I do have a lot of good recipes in there. Some of them are ones literally that you can just kind of just eat constantly, and the more you eat, the better they are for your body. Like the um, the um, free soup, Dieter's best friend. Oh, I could live on that stuff. So good. So if you do, if you make like a big pot of free soup, and then you eat a bowl of that before every meal, you're going to get most of your bulk filling up on that soup, and then you're not going to eat as much of the other stuff that maybe is not as good for you. So I hope that helps. Now this one, y'all, I'm just reading this to you, and I'm hoping that y'all can help. Um, Dear Christy, I live in Ottumwa, and I hope I pronounced that right. If not, I'm sorry. Ottumwa, Iowa. A landmark place in Ottumwa is the Alley Canteen. It has been an establishment since the 1930s. My brothers and I grew up at, on Alley Canteens. It has been a family tradition to try to duplicate the Alley Canteen recipe, but it has not been accomplished yet. The canteen is basically loose hamburger put on a bun. Yes, similar to the Made Right, but a million times better. I prefer Alley Canteen to Made Right. Okay, I have to interject here. I don't get out of Alabama much. I have traveled a lot. I have traveled a lot with Southern Plate with book tours and to do TV and stuff, but when I travel places, I tend to be in my hotel room or at a bookstore or at a TV station, and then I go right back to my hotel room. <laughs> so I don't know what a maid right is, and I also don't know what an alley canteen is, other than what um, she has told me right here, which it sounds great. I want to try it. Um, but y'all gonna have to help me out and give me a little, you know, tell me, do we have anything in Alabama that compares to this that I can try and, you know, um, or do I need to go to Iowa? I've never been to Iowa. Maybe I need to go. It sounds like they got some real good food there. I've done some research regarding the canteen's recipe and it said that in the thirties, beef heart was added to the hamburger. Someone else reported and added Coca-Cola to the recipe. I've heard in order to duplicate a recipe, one needs the restaurant steamer. So my question is, do you think adding beef heart to ground beef will make a difference? And does one need a restaurant steamer to duplicate the recipe? Um, okay, I, like I said, I'm not sure the sandwich you're talking about. I would love to have one right now because I'm kind of hungry. Um, but adding, anytime you add organ meat just to uh, another part of ground meat, it is going to definitely change the flavor. Um, there's a lot of different flavors to the different cuts of meat, so that would make a huge difference. I don't know if it's going to make the difference you're wanting, but it will make a difference, so it's definitely worth trying if you can. As far as uh, restaurant equipment, in most cases, we can duplicate that at home. I would not say you need a restaurant steamer. I'm going to assume, I don't know if you're saying they're steaming the meat, which they're going to have to cook that another way too, or maybe if they're steaming the bun. It would be easy to do. Um, if they're steaming the bun, what you can do is assemble the sandwich and wrap it in a wet paper towel and nuke it, <laughs> you know, for just a little bit. Because um, we like to steam hot dog buns and stuff, and we do that. But I need to find out more information on the sandwich. And y'all, please, if anybody has any of these recipes that um, she's wanting, please, please share them with us. Um, 
in the comments on this post because I would love to be able to help her out. And like I said, we may need to have a field trip. Um, one of my favorite, she also says, one of my favorite soups is Wisconsin cheese soup. Do you have a southern cheese soup similar to Wisconsin cheese soup? Um, I'm just going to have to go to Wisconsin. I'm going to make a field trip now because I've never had Wisconsin cheese soup. So I have no idea what it's like. So anybody who knows if you have a recipe that's comparable, let me know because I would like to try it. I would also like to try this made right burger or the alley can. So, okay. I'm going to try to go about five more minutes because oh, maybe we'll get done. I don't know. Now I've got three pages still. Okay. Um, Lynn says, can you substitute self fries and flour in a recipe when it calls for all purpose with the baking powder and salt? In most cases, yes. Um, okay, so all purpose flour is just plain flour. Um, self rising flour is flour that has had leaveners added, like baking, baking powder. And salt. so a lot of the recipes will call for maybe all purpose flour with a little bit of salt, a little bit of baking powder. And what you do is just substitute and use self rising flour and just leave out the salt and the baking powder. And that works just fine in just about every recipe. Um, it is going to, sometimes it might change the cookies a little bit. They might rise a little bit more. They might not rise quite as much. Generally, it's not going to be enough of a difference to warrant you not taking the shortcut if you want to take the shortcut. One time I have had it backfire on me. In my entire cooking career, I've had it backfire one time. And that's when I went to make my, um, my chocolate pound cake recipe with the fudge glaze and I decided to substitute self rising flour for the all purpose and don't do that. Just don't. Um, don't. I will say that burnt chocolate doesn't smell near as bad as you think it's going to smell, but it does linger. So, um, <laughs> in case I recommend it, but in quick breads and stuff, I've, I've never had a problem doing that in quick breads. I did like banana bread and stuff. I did that all the time. Okay. Um, let's see. Janet says, I love all the slow cooker recipes, most especially in the summer, because I grew up in Alabama and now live in Florida. I feel you. I love my slow cooker in the summer. This house gets hot enough. Um, the last thing I want to do is cook when it seems like 200 degrees outside. My question is, is it really okay to cook chicken in the slow cooker? I've read different opinions. The biggest concern being it doesn't get hot enough, fast enough, and the chicken can make you sick. The temperature in the slow cookers doesn't get as high as the stovetop or oven, so I just skip over the chicken recipes, even though they look amazing. Can you please help? Yes, um, it is absolutely okay. It is perfectly safe to cook chicken in a slow cooker. You get it. You get it well past the danger zone. Yes, it gets there slowly, but so does chicken. Any, when you put chicken in your oven, it takes a while to get up to the temperature of the oven anyway. So it gets there a little more slowly, but then it gets up to that peak temperature and it stays there long enough to make it perfectly safe to eat. Having said this, I'm referring to properly working slow cookers. Um, so, you know, like I said earlier, I would want a slow cooker that had been purchased within the last 10 years. And it's a minimum investment to go get one. But yes, it's absolutely safe to cook chicken in a slow cooker. Perfectly fine. Eat it, enjoy it. It's going to be moist, tender, delicious, and you're going to love it. Absolutely safe. Um, what made you choose your choice of degree in college? I love your blog and your honesty. Well, thank you very much. Okay, um, I have a, for those who don't know, I have a Bachelor's of Science in um, Human Environmental Science is what my degree is called. In some colleges, it's called Family and Consumer Science. In the old days, <clears throat> before this politically correctness, um, it was called home economics. <laughs> so you may recognize that. Um, actually, I started out as a nursing major. I was 23. I, I went to work full time as a bank teller as soon as I graduated high school. And I worked in various banks and I really wanted to go to college, um, but I just didn't have a way to afford it. So I worked for a couple years. Um, and then when I was 23, I quit full time work and went to go to college full time and uh, paid for everything myself. I'm still paying for it. I'll be paying for it for a long time. Um, and um, I started out as a nursing major because at the ripe old age of 23, I had already given up on the thought of uh, finding someone and getting married. <laughs> I'd, already, I'd already given up on dating, completely given up. And so I wanted a job that I would enjoy, that I could help people, and I would also be able to support myself. I wanted to be able to, you know, 
maybe have a, buy a house and, and, you know, just have, have a nice little life. And so nursing was a really good career for that. And I took all of my um, core classes. I took anatomy, physiology, all the chemistries, all those really bad maths. I took all that and I was ready to go into nursing school. And right about then, lo and behold, I met my husband. He wasn't my husband then, of course. And um, we, we were married like a year after we met, we got married. And um, I was getting ready to go to nursing school and I was dreading it because I'd had so many people. I, there was two people in nursing school who had just recently got divorced. And they said it was really hard on marriages and all this stuff. And I was really worried about um, that trial so early in our marriage, you know, about the hours and stuff, which is really silly now, knowing what the first year of having a child is like. And you're worried about some college classes in the evenings and having to be in some other towns at the crack of dawn. I mean, that was silly. But anyway, I was dreading it and I just wasn't, I, I lost my enthusiasm for it right as I was about to go to nursing school. So my husband said, well, what do you enjoy? Why don't you, you know, why don't you major in something that you enjoy that you want to do? And I thought, well, I really like sewing. I like cooking. I always loved home economics. And he said, well, why don't you major in that instead? And so I switched and, uh, I love, I, I loved it. Um, you know, it's a shame how many, how many women would be hesitant. Well, my age and especially younger would be hesitant to say, I love sewing. I love cooking. I like that, you know, because our society discourages that so much. Um, and it's, I don't know. I won't get into that, but anyway, I love it. And, uh, I got my degree from the university of North Alabama, which is actually a very large college in Florence, Alabama. Um, we had a wonderful department and, uh, it's just, I, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed getting that degree. I enjoyed every aspect of it. So I'm glad I did. So that's kind of the long way, um, around the block to tell you how I got, chose my degree. Um, hi, this is from Pansy. I want to know if you have a recipe for a good moist whipping cream pound cake. Yes. <laughs> um, Aunt Sue's famous pound cake. Go to southernplate.com. Type in Aunt Sue's famous pound cake or go to Google. That is an honest to goodness, old fashioned whipping cream pound cake. And that's the one that always kind of freaks people out a little bit because it doesn't have baking soda, baking powder, and salt and stuff because it's not, it doesn't rely on those things to make it rise. A true old fashioned pound cake has whipping cream and eggs and things. And the air incorporated in those as you mix it up is what makes the pound cake rise. And I've had so many people think that recipe is not going to work. And then they try it. Oh, it's the best recipe ever. So yes, please try it. It's delicious. I love it. And then get mama's custard sauce to go over it. Cause that's how we eat our pancake. We pour the custard sauce on each slice and it's amazing. Okay. I'm going to try to just keep going. And if y'all are tired of listening, y'all just go ahead and bow out now. But I got about, I've only got really one more sheet. So I should be quick. I'll try to speed up. Um, Okay, this is from Marie. I'm going on an 11 hour road trip this weekend. I want to cook so we don't have to eat a bunch of yucky fast food. Tips on what might travel well. Okay, well, let me just tell you, I'm probably one of the few people I know who actually has traveled with a slow cooker and cooked supper in my hotel room. Um, because I know what, if you're going on a long road trip and you're eating all that mess and you're not, especially your body's not used to fast food and even fast food that's not really greasy. Ooh, it, it gets on you after a while, you know. Um, but let me tell you one of the things that we do. When we drive to Orlando, it's a 12-hour drive. And, okay, technically it's 10. But with us, here we get it's 12 hours. So I go to the grocery store, and I buy a big thing of those Hawaiian sweet rolls. And then in the deli, I buy sliced roast beef and sharp cheddar. And I make what we call road trip sandwiches. I keep the meat and the um, cheese in a little like lunch bag type thing down in my floorboard. <clears throat> and then I'll get the rolls and I'll start making sandwiches and I'll say, Ricky, you want a sandwich? Oh no, I'm good. That means make him three. So I'll open up, you know, I'll be opening up and I make the sandwiches. And as soon as I get done with the first one, well, go ahead and make me one. And he ends up eating three and I'll say, Brady, you want a sandwich? Oh no, I'm good. And then wait a minute, are you making those? And so I'll just make little sandwiches, you know, I'll lay a little paper towel or something in my lap and I'll just make sandwiches and hand them around the car and everybody's happy. And that number one, it saves us a lot of money, a lot of money. I mean, even just eating fast food for four people, it's like, you know, sometimes 30 bucks, it's ridiculous and it's not worth it. Um, and it also just makes us feel better. I also make a lot of uh, bar cookies and things. Um, like if I'm going on a big trip, I'll make a big pan of oatmeal scotchies. I have a recipe on Southern Plate that uses a bacon mix and they're these nice big bars. Um, 
And then as far as cooking, like, you know, we don't do a lot of meals traveling because we usually don't have a way to heat them up. So we do sandwiches and light things like that. And, you know, we just, we went to Disney World a couple months ago and I have a loaf of bread and a jar of peanut butter and some jelly in our hotel room. And I keep those little sandwich containers. And I, every morning before we go into the parks, I make everybody a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And, and we carry it in our backpacks. And that's what we eat, you know, because it's just, you just can't justify the expense. And then, of course, like I said, when you compare it with how bad the food makes you feel anyway. So I do try road trip sandwiches like those. Um, and then we also, if we stay in a hotel that has a microwave or something, um, you know, we might pick up something, a, a shelf stable heat and eat meal that the kids like or something, you know. Um, and then we usually, when we're traveling, we eat out about once a day and just choose where you eat wisely. I tend to be, I don't, I'm not a big experimenter when it comes to food. If I'm going to pay for food, I want to know I'm going to like it. Um, and so I tend to stick with Cracker Barrel. I like, ate a lot of salads. Um, we went out to eat for the first time and I think it was about three months. We were trying to figure out what we couldn't remember the last time we went out to eat this past weekend. And it was the four of us and we let our son invite a friend and we didn't go to an expensive restaurant. We went to um, a Mexican restaurant in our area, just, you know, normal where people walk in. And by the time we add the tip and everything, it cost us about $70. And um, yeah, that's why we don't eat out. <laughs> Cause I think I can make supper for my whole family for a week, really nice suppers for that. So yeah, I think that's one of the first things that we should all cut out when it comes to budgeting and things. But that, you know, that's me. Y'all, it may be worth more to you than it is to me, and that's fine. I'm not talking to you personally, Marie. Um, but, yeah, I would try the road trip sandwiches and things um, and make you some snack bars and stuff like that ahead of time. Um, brownies travel well. I know I'm thinking mostly sweets here, but they're just, they travel so well. Um, look at things like that, maybe. Um, and then here, um, hi, I was wondering if you have any recipes that use sorghum syrup. When I was a girl growing up in North Georgia, my grandparents always used sorghum syrup on biscuits or just on slices of bread. My grandfather would pour a puddle of it on his plate, mix in butter with a fork until it was blended and golden, and then he would sop it up with a hot biscuit. You were singing the song of my childhood here. Um, I would love to find a recipe using sorghum in cookies, breads, and I would also like to know where I can order some. I live in Virginia, and they don't know about sorghum. Okay. I love sorghum. Um, I especially like it on uh, Greek yogurt. I put like a tablespoon or two on top of some Greek yogurt. Oh, so good. Now, as far as breads and things, you're typically going to find it in things like gingerbreads and spice breads, gingerbread cookies and things like that. I don't have a lot of recipes I use it in because my people eat it just like your people eat it. <laughs> you know, you scrape it together with some butter. I mean, I remember my grandparents doing that and then you hot biscuit. Oh, there's nothing like it in this world. There's nothing like it. Um, I don't know where you can order it. We go a lot. Um, we're getting to be time where you can go up to the Amish. I would think they would have it in Pennsylvania. The Amish in Etheridge, Tennessee sell it in big pails, like almost like they look like paint cans. And I get a lot from them. So check around the Amish. I bet they can get it for you. If not, um, if they don't have it to sell, they can get it for you. And in some of their general stores around there, I would think you would have those in Pennsylvania, but I don't know exactly what part of Pennsylvania you're in. And I've never actually been in Pennsylvania before. So I could be speak. I'm speaking from complete and utter ignorance here, but I'm hoping. <laughs> so y'all, if anybody listening to this knows where she can um, get some sorghum up there, you let me know. And if you have any recipes to share with her, please share those also. Um, here is Kathy. I would love to learn more about cooking with cast iron skillets. What's the best way to preserve them and how to clean them? I have a cast iron skillet and every time I use it, it smokes terribly. I have no idea what I'm doing wrong. Um, I would, I would go ahead and wash that one. Now I know it's sacrilege, but wash it in some dishwater in your sink with some dish soap real good. Um, rinse it real good. Let it dry. Then let's go ahead and season it again. Um, what you want to do is ideally you want to get lard from the grocery store. They do have lard or you can use Crisco in a pinch. Coat that sucker front and back real good with it. Put it on a, a pan upside down. Well, put it right side up first in the oven. Turn it on real low and just let it heat. You know, just let it go a couple hours. It, those pores open up and it absorbs that oil in. And that's what's going to give it that smooth, that nonstick surface and everything. And then when you're done with that, take it out. Let it cool completely. 
wipe it dry, put it in your, in your cabinet. Um, normally, you don't ever wash those with soap. As soon as you're done using it, you just, you know, if you made bread, you just wipe it out with a dish towel. So maybe put a little more um, Crisco or something in it and put right back in your cabinet. Um, if you cook something else and you have to wash it, wash it real quick. <laughs> Dry it out real good and then spread a little Crisco or something in it and then wipe it clean and then put that in your um, pantry. They're they're really good for uh, so many things. You do, it does take a while to get used to the feel of cast iron. Um, and you don't don't feel like you have to use cast iron just because a recipe calls for it. You can use a regular pan and you'll be fine. I made cornbread in a cake pan for years until I got some good cast iron. Um, and there's also a tutorial step-by-step -step on how to season cast iron on Southern Plate. I think that'll help you as well. Um, would you ever consider partnering, partnering with somebody for your gluten-free audience? Um, I've been gluten-free for three years. Um, and, oh, her, her husband has celiac disease. Okay, this is very serious. Please understand that celiac is a different animal from gluten intolerance, gluten sensitivity. Um, it's a disease. It, it's a very rare thing but it causes a lot of pain in the people who have it. So it's very important that they afford, um, avoid gluten. I actually, my family does not eat, my, we're all about the gluten. We eat all kinds of gluten. Um, we make up for anybody who's not eating gluten in the population right now. So um, this, is, this isn't something that I know anything about. Um, and it's not something that I, I've had to look into because no one in my family has ever had a problem with uh, gluten or celiac. Um, there are so many good blogs on the internet who live this lifestyle every day, and those are the experts. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like um, somebody who speaks nothing but French deciding to teach an English class. So I just defer to the experts on that. And she asked another question too, and I'm going to, um, this is from Kathy, I'm gonna email you um, and answer that other question. Um, and this is the last one. We made it. Oh, okay. Um, somebody said, do you have a good biscuit recipe? Okay. Boy, howdy. You know, biscuit recipes to Southern women are like shoes. You can't have just one. You know, when I'm trying, when I'm teaching someone how to make biscuits, I teach them with three recipes. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I teach them to do is to make the basic three ingredient biscuits. This is on Southern plate. Type in three ingredient biscuits. That's self-rising flour, Crisco, and milk. I teach them how to do that one first, and they're delicious. Um, and I have all my hints and tips there. The main thing to remember is, in biscuits, as in relationships, it's important never to be too needy. You don't want to over-need your biscuits. That's how you end up with hockey pucks. The other recipe I teach them to make is the, um, oh, it's just the best buttermilk biscuits on earth. It's also on Southern Plate. Buttermilk biscuits, how to make homemade buttermilk biscuits, I believe is the name of the post. And that's a little bit different method. <clears throat> you're actually cutting butter into your flour, and then you're chilling that. And you end up with a very sticky dough that you just have to kind of pat out. It's very sticky, very, you know, soft, but it makes these incredibly tender biscuits. And the key to all your biscuits is don't overneed. And also, when you're putting them on the pan, make sure they touch. You want all your biscuits to touch in as many areas as possible. So I want these two biscuits touching. I want this biscuit touching. I want this biscuit. You know, you want them to touch because biscuits are like good friends, and they help each other to rise. Um, and so that's going to be higher biscuits. The other thing I teach them how to make is hoe cake, which is on Southern Plate. Hoe cake. It is not the hoe cake that some people consider that has cornmeal. Um, our hoe cake is like a big, giant, fluffy biscuit with a crunchy crust it is heaven take some of that sorghum put a little on it little butter hot from the pan and so those are the three biscuits that I teach people how to make and all those recipes are on southern plate and once you have those three recipes down pat you've got your whole biscuit making repertoire for your life um, I hope this was helpful to you I enjoyed getting to visit with you thank you so much for sending in those questions um, to all my subscribers if you don't subscribe by email yet you can go to southernplate.com forward slash subscribe and um, I may end up getting more questions throughout the day on that email address. And if I do, I may have to do another video. But for now, um, my daughter's ready to start homeschool. So <laughs> I'm running a little behind, but I couldn't resist visiting with y'all a little bit. I hope you have a wonderful day. Um, there's always something to be grateful for. We just got to decide what we're going to fix or focus on. And so if you're having a hard time finding something to be grateful for, um, or seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, we may need to realize, oh, am I staring at a dark spot? <laughs> do I need to do I need to shift my focus today? Do I need to look? You know, seek and you shall find. 
So if you're only finding things to complain and feel depressed and negative about, then we gotta we gotta uh, kind of take a look at what we're seeking out. So let's start seeking out the joy today. Let's seek out the good things. We can get out there and do this. You were put here for a reason, and the world is not going to become a better place on its own. We need you. <laughs> so I'll see y'all later. Y'all have a wonderful day. Love you. Bye bye.